The nightclub was alive with energy, pulsating with the latest hits that made the air itself seem to vibrate. Joe, caught in the whirl of lights and laughter, found himself in a heated debate with his friend Matt over another round of shots. They were standing at the edge of the VIP zone, where a group of their friends were lounging around a table, immersed in the night's revelries. Come on, Matt! It's just one more round! Joe pleaded, his voice barely rising above the music. Matt shook his head firmly, the colorful lights casting shifting shadows on his face. Joe, we've had enough, man. You too. Let's not end the night on a bad note. Joe's plea turned into a back and forth, his words growing sharper with each exchange. Since when did you turn into such a buzzkill? Joe's frustration bubbled over, the alcohol fueling his irritation. Matt stood his ground, his concern for Joe clear in his eyes. It's not about being a buzzkill. It's about knowing when to stop. The tension between them snapped as Joe, fueled by a mixture of defiance and the buzz of alcohol, shoved Matt away with a burst of anger. Fine, if you won't join me, I don't need you to have fun, Joe declared, storming off towards the bar, leaving a stunned Matt in his wake. Minutes later, Joe returned triumphantly, balancing a tray laden with shots, a wide grin plastered across his face. The group erupted into cheers at the sight, the earlier altercation forgotten in the face of more drinks. Joe's infectious enthusiasm spread through the group as they all reached for the shots, toasting to the night and downing them in unison. As the laughter and chatter resumed, a girl sitting next to Joe leaned in, her lips brushing his ear as she whispered something that made his grin widen. The music and the collective noise of the club swallowed their exchange, leaving it a mystery to everyone but them. Meanwhile, Matt, who had watched the scene unfold with a mix of concern and resignation, noticed Joe's jacket draped over a chair. Seizing a moment when all eyes were on Joe in his whispered conversation, Matt discreetly picked up the jacket. With a quick glance around to ensure no one was watching, he slipped his hand into one of the pockets and removed something, tucking it into his own pocket with a subtle move. The night had taken a toll on Joe, the alcohol rendering the world around him a dizzying blur. With a girl clinging to each arm, he stumbled out of the nightclub, their laughter mingling with the distant thump of the bass from inside. The cool night air did little to sober him up as they teetered on the edge of the sidewalk, the girls peppering him with questions about his car. Where'd you park, Joe? One of them slurred, her words barely cutting through the fog in his mind. Joe squinted at the sea of vehicles, his car nowhere to be seen in the dimly lit street. Panic began to set in, further fueled by his inebriated state. He patted his pockets in a clumsy attempt to find his keys, his movements erratic and uncoordinated. When his hands came up empty, he plunged them into the inner pockets of his jacket with a growing sense of desperation. Still, no keys. A string of curses escaped him as he turned on his heel, the girl's questions fading into the background. He barged back into the nightclub, the sudden assault of lights and sound making his head spin even more. Matt was right where Joe had left him, sipping on a soda amidst the chaos. The sight of him seemed to anchor Joe, if only slightly. Did you take my damn keys, Matt? Joe demanded, his voice laced with accusation. Without a word, Matt stood, the resignation in his eyes speaking volumes. Let's get you home, he said, his tone even, but firm. But Joe wasn't having any of it. With a shove, he snatched the keys from Matt's hand, the action sparking a flash of anger in Matt's eyes that quickly faded to a weary sigh. Matt shook his head, a silent admission of defeat. He was tired, so tired of playing the guardian to a man who refused to be saved from himself. When Joe stepped back outside, the girls were gone, vanished as quickly as the night's jubilance. Joe's drive home was a blur of adrenaline and disregard, his sleek sports car cutting through the quiet streets like a knife. The speedometer needle pushed further to the right, ignoring the glaring red signs that begged for moderation. The city's slumbering state was the only thing that stood between his recklessness and potential disaster. 
Upon reaching his house, the tranquility of the night was shattered by the screech of metal as Joe misjudged his entry, his car colliding with the gates. Cursing under his breath, he stumbled out of the vehicle, his movements clumsy and uncoordinated from the night's indulgences. With a mix of anger and desperation, he wrestled with the gates, forcing them back into a semblance of closure, all while muttering a string of expletives. So unbeknownst to him, his actions were under the watchful eye of his father, Chuck, who observed the scene from a shadowed window. The dim light did little to conceal his stern expression, a silent witness to his son's latest folly. As Joe made his way towards the house, the sinking feeling of being watched crept over him. Looking up, he caught sight of his father's silhouette, the realization hitting him like a cold wave. With a frustrated curse, he turned away, seeking refuge in his room, bracing himself for the inevitable storm that was sure to come with the morning sun. Yet morning brought a different kind of silence. There were no stern lectures from Chuck, no disappointed looks from his mother, Linda. The household seemed to carry on as if the night's events were just a figment of his imagination. But the presence of two men quietly repairing the gates spoke volumes, a tangible reminder of his reckless actions. The day stretched on for Joe, unusually long and filled with an unsettling silence. Linda, his mother, who usually played the role of mediator between him and his father's stern ways, seemed to have withdrawn her comforting presence. It was a change that left Joe feeling exposed and unusually reflective. No calls came his way, no inquiries about his well-being, nothing to break the silence that had enveloped the household since the previous night's incident. This lack of communication was foreign to Joe, who had grown accustomed to his mother's nurturing check-ins, regardless of the circumstances. As the evening crept in, Joe found himself devoid of the usual urge to escape the confines of home for the promise of nighttime escapades. Instead, he stayed, the weight of the previous night's actions and the day's ensuing silence holding him down. Dinner time arrived, and with it, a sense of trepidation. Joe hesitated before making his way to the dining room, where he found Chuck and Linda already seated, engaging in a meal shrouded in quietude. The atmosphere was charged with an unspoken tension a departure from the usual casual banter that accompanied their meals. Taking a deep breath, Joe approached the table and took his seat, attempting to pierce the veil of silence with small talk. Nice evening, isn't it? He ventured, his voice sounding foreign in the quiet of the room. His parents' responses were clipped, devoid of the warmth he was accustomed to. Yes, Linda replied, her gaze fixed on her plate, no, Chuck added in response to another of Joe's attempted conversation starters. I don't know, came the answer to yet another question, their words sparing and measured. The realization dawned on Joe, heavy and undeniable. For the first time, he was faced with the possibility that his parents, his steadfast supporters, through every misstep and misadventure, might have reached the limits of their patience. The thought that they could have given up hope on him was a sobering one, forcing Joe to confront the impact of his actions, not just on himself, but on those who cared for him the most. The quiet of his room felt suffocating after dinner, the silent exchanges at the table replaying in Joe's mind as he lay on his bed, staring blankly at the ceiling. The weight of the realization that his parents might have lost hope in him was a burden too heavy to bear in silence and stillness. Driven by a restless energy, Joe found himself rising from his bed, drawn to the attic where the past lay in boxes, dusty and forgotten. The attic was a time capsule, each box a gateway to memories long past. He rummaged through them, his hands moving with a purpose he couldn't quite understand, driven by an urge to reconnect with simpler times. His fingers brushed against the spines of old books and the edges of photo albums filled with moments frozen in time. One album in particular caught his eye, its cover worn from years of being untouched. Flipping it open, Joe was greeted by a photograph that sent a jolt of nostalgia through him. There he was, a young boy of six or seven, his face lit up with joy, clutching a cotton candy 
as if it were the world's greatest treasure. The photograph was a portal, transporting him back to a time when life was simpler, filled with small joys and the comforting presence of his parents. The memory of that day unfolded in his mind, the sounds and smells of the amusement park mingling with the warmth of being surrounded by his family. But beneath the surface of that happy memory was the echo of his parents' voices, caught in a moment of quiet debate. It wasn't an argument, but rather a careful consideration of their modest means. The decision to take him to the amusement park, to spend money on something as frivolous as cotton candy and a jacket, was a sacrifice cloaked in love. They debated the practicality of the jacket, wondering if it could make any difference at work, weighing the joy of the day against the cost. Lost in the sea of memories, Joe stumbled upon another, more bitter one. He remembered the day his father, Chuck, bought him his first car during his freshman year, a simple, reliable yellow Honda. It was a day that should have been filled with gratitude and joy, yet Joe recalled the dissatisfaction that had clouded his heart. He had wanted something more, something that would stand out among his peers, a fancier, more expensive car, perhaps a truck like the one some of his friends boasted. Chuck, at that time, could have easily afforded a more luxurious car. His real estate business was flourishing, marking the culmination of years of hard work and dedication. Yet he had chosen reliability and sensibility over extravagance, a decision that Joe had failed to appreciate. The flood of memories carried Joe further along the currents of his past to his college years one of the best colleges that had been more than he could have ever dreamed of attending. The first two years had been promising. He had excelled academically, fueled by a genuine interest in his studies and a bright future ahead. However, the onset of his junior year marked a turning point. Joe found himself entangled with a crowd that introduced him to a lifestyle far removed from the hard work and dedication that had brought him there. The allure of constant partying, gambling, drinking, and fleeting relationships began to overshadow his academic ambitions. What started as missing a few classes soon spiraled into a complete derailment of his college career, leading to his eventual dropout in the second half of the year. For two years following his departure from college, Joe lived a life devoid of direction or purpose. Nights were spent chasing fleeting pleasures, and days were lost to recuperating from the excesses of the night before. The cycle was relentless, a far cry from the potential and opportunities that had once laid before him. The small diner was a world away from the life Joe had known, a quiet place where thoughts seemed to have room to breathe. As he sipped his coffee, the missed calls on his phone from his usual circle of friends seemed to echo the life he was trying to leave behind. Their persistence was a reminder of the cycle he was determined to break. Nearby, the conversation between two elderly men caught Joe's attention. The weight of their words, laden with concern and the tough choices that come with age, pulled at something within him. He listened as one man, evidently worn by life's toils, spoke of his ailing wife and the need to let go of their struggling farm, a piece of his life he was reluctantly offering to his friend. The friend's refusal, grounded in his own commitments, left the conversation hanging in an air of unresolved futures. Compelled by an impulse that surprised even himself, Joe stood and approached the men. May I sit with you? He asked, the question hanging awkwardly in the air as the two men regarded him with a mix of surprise and curiosity. Joe's appearance, far from the typical farmers, drew a skeptical look from Harold, the man looking to sell his farm. What makes you think I want to sell it to someone like you? Harold's voice carried a mix of disbelief and challenge, eyeing Joe's leather jacket and the air of the city that clung to him. Yet there they were the next day. Harold Carson, 86 years old and weathered by a lifetime of farming, guiding Joe through the expanse of his property. Here's where we keep the meat chickens, Harold explained, gesturing towards a modest coop where a few chickens pecked at the ground. They moved on to a small pen housing several pigs. The simplicity of the setup a stark contrast to the complexities of the life Joe was leaving behind. 
The barn was the final stop where Harold showcased the farm equipment that would come with the property. The cozy house on the hillside, with its welcoming glow and walls adorned with memories, was a stark contrast to the world Joe had known. Each photograph told a story, a piece of Harold's life etched into the very fabric of the home. As Joe wandered through the rooms, he felt an unexpected sense of peace, the tranquility of the countryside seeping into his bones, offering a respite from the relentless pace of city life. Why are you selling such a nice place? Joe's question hung in the air, tinged with genuine curiosity and a hint of sadness for the loss of such a beautiful retreat. Harold paused, the weight of memories and decisions momentarily silencing him. Joe could sense the hesitation, the internal debate about how much to reveal. Finally, with a sigh that seemed to carry years of joy and sorrow, Harold began to share his story. This farm, it's more than just land to me, Harold started, his voice laced with a love that was palpable. Growing up in the city, my only escape was my uncle's farm. Those summers, working the land, learning from my uncle, they shaped me, made me dream of a life out here away from the noise and the haste. Harold's gaze drifted as if he could see the past unfolding before him. Amy and I, we wanted a piece of that peace, that simplicity, this land, this house. It was a promise to her, a testament to a love that's weathered much. Unable to have children of their own, they turned their hearts towards adoption, bringing young Ron into their lives. The joy of their family, finally complete with Ron's arrival, filled the room, a poignant reminder of the depth of their love. But when Ron turned four, everything changed. Harold continued, his voice breaking with the pain of the memory. His biological mother. She came back for him, said it was a mistake to let him go. And the judge, he agreed with her. Joe could only imagine the devastation that decision wrought upon Harold and Amy. The loss of Ron, the child who had completed their family, was a blow from which it seemed they never fully recovered. The once simple disagreements between Harold and Amy evolved into something more painful. Their words often charged with the unsaid, the what-ifs in the heartache of their loss. Amy always feared I'd leave because of, well, because we couldn't have children of our own, Harold confided, the old pain surfacing in his eyes. But leaving her, that thought never crossed my mind, not once. Joe saw the depth of Harold's commitment in his actions, in the life he had built with Amy away from the judgmental eyes of the world. The farm wasn't just a home, it was a sanctuary, a place where Harold had hoped to shield Amy from the pain and insecurity her infertility caused her. It was a gesture of love, profound and enduring, a promise of togetherness against the odds. The land, this house, it was supposed to be our fresh start, Harold said, a distant look in his eyes as he gazed around the room, each corner filled with memories of a life built together, of dreams shared and lost. Joe felt a swell of respect for Harold, a man who had weathered the storms of life with unwavering love for his wife. The story of the Carsons, marked by love loss and the resilience of the human spirit, resonated with Joe, offering a glimpse into the depth of bonds that bind a family, even in the face of life's cruelest twists. The soft afternoon light filtered through the windows of the cozy hillside house, casting a warm glow over the room where Joe and Harold sat. The weight of Harold's words hung in the air, a testament to the realities of aging and the difficult decisions that come with it. We're old, Joe, Harold reiterated, his voice tinged with a resignation that came from accepting life's inevitable changes. Living out here, away from everything, it's not as easy as it used to be. We need to be closer to help, just in case. Joe understood. The farm, with all its beauty and tranquility, was a reminder of the Carson's past, a past filled with both love and loss. Now the future called for practicality, for the assurance of safety and care that only the proximity to town could offer. The desire to help Harold and Amy to take on the stewardship of the land they loved grew stronger within Joe. 
it was an opportunity not just to start anew, but to prove to his own parents, and perhaps to himself, that he could turn his life around. Yet the financial hurdle was significant. The price of the farm was beyond what Joe could afford outright, and he knew better than to expect financial assistance from his parents, given his past recklessness. That evening, as he returned to his parents' home, Joe was lost in thought, his mind racing with potential solutions. Then an idea struck, a sacrifice that could serve as a bridge to his new future. His sports car, the last symbol of his fast-paced city life, could be the key. The decision to sell the car came with a mix of relief and determination. It represented a third of the farm's cost, a substantial start to his plan. Joe wasted no time, listing the car for sale at a price just below market value to ensure a quick transaction. The response was immediate. The allure of a sports car at a bargain price attracted a flurry of interested buyers, and before long, Joe had secured a deal. The car, once a badge of his old life, was exchanged for a stack of cash, a tangible step towards his new beginning. Joe's heart pounded with a mix of excitement and apprehension as he made his way back to the farm, the cash from his car's sale securely in his possession. The crisp air of the countryside filled his lungs, grounding him in the reality of the moment, a moment that could mark the beginning of a new chapter in his life. Upon arrival, Joe found Harold in the same cozy room they had shared their stories just days before. The old man looked up, a mixture of curiosity and surprise crossing his weathered face as Joe approached. Harold, I've been thinking a lot about this farm, about what it could become, Joe started, his voice steady with resolve. I can't pay the full price up front, but I can offer a third now. For the rest, I was hoping we could work out an arrangement. Maybe I could pay you the balance later in the year, or even offer you shares in the business I plan to start here. The proposal hung in the air, a tangible shift in the room as Harold processed Joe's words. The initial sparkle in Harold's eyes at the mention of shares in a future business gave way to a more contemplative gaze. The old farmer was no stranger to the realities of life, the need for security, especially in the twilight years. After a moment of silence, Harold nodded, a slow, deliberate movement that conveyed both his trust in Joe and the acceptance of his own circumstances. I like you, Joe, Harold said, his voice tinged with a warmth that spoke of more than just a business transaction. I'll take the rest of the payment later in the year. Let's make this official. Relief washed over Joe, followed closely by a surge of determination. He didn't have a concrete plan on how to fulfill his promise, but his resolve to make the farm a success was unwavering. The challenge of transforming the farm into a thriving business ignited a spark in Joe, a desire to prove himself and honor the trust Harold had placed in him. Handshakes sealed their agreement, a simple yet profound exchange that marked the start of Joe's journey from a life of aimless indulgence to one of purpose and promise. As he walked the land that was now his to steward, Joe felt the weight of responsibility and the thrill of possibility. The path ahead was uncertain, but for the first time in a long time, Joe was eager to walk it, to see where hard work and a newfound purpose could lead him. Harold and Amy took their time walking Joe through the ins and outs of farm life. Their guidance was thorough, covering everything from the daily routines to the quirks of the old barn. They mentioned the two employees who had become essential to the farm's operations, assuring him that despite their weekend absence, they were reliable and hardworking individuals who would return first thing Monday morning. With heartfelt goodbyes, Harold and Amy finally made their departure, leaving Joe standing alone on the porch of the farmhouse, the reality of his decision settling in. The weight of ownership, of stepping into shoes much larger than he was used to, suddenly felt overwhelming. The farm, with its aged structures and few remaining animals, stood as a testament to the life Harold and Amy had built and now entrusted to him. Joe's gaze swept over the land, taking in the quiet dignity of the place that was now his responsibility. The challenges were evident, the business teetering on the brink of viability. But as the evening turned to night, Joe found himself filled with a resolve he hadn't known before. 
Seated on the porch under the vast country sky, he let his mind wander through a maze of possibilities, each idea a spark in the dark, guiding him towards a vision of what this farm could become under his care. The hours slipped by, but Joe barely noticed, his thoughts a whirlwind of plans and dreams for the future. As Joe pondered the potential of the farm, the initial thought of ramping up fresh produce production flickered through his mind. The idea seemed straightforward enough. Expand the fields, increase the yield, and dive into the market with gusto. But as quickly as the idea came, it was overshadowed by the stark reality of competing against the agricultural giants that dominated the industry. The thought of going head-to-head -head with such behemoths was daunting. Their resources and reach could easily overshadow a small-scale operation like his. The realization that traditional farming methods wouldn't suffice in this David versus Goliath scenario sparked a determination in Joe to think outside the box. He understood that to make the farm sustainable and profitable, he needed to carve out a niche that the larger companies either overlooked or considered unprofitable. The challenge was to find that unique angle, something that would set his farm apart and appeal to a specific market or need that was currently underserved. On his first morning as a new owner, Joe was greeted by the bright sunlight streaming through his window, a stark contrast to the late nights and groggy mornings of his previous life. Peering outside, he noticed a middle-aged man clad in work overalls diligently tending to the animals, a routine start to what was an unfamiliar day for Joe. Eager to acquaint himself with every aspect of farm life, Joe quickly dressed and stepped outside. As he approached the man, he was met with a gruff assessment that took him by surprise. I didn't know Harold was into city boys, the man remarked, eyeing Joe with a mix of skepticism and amusement. We need stronger hands over here, he continued, gesturing for Joe to follow. All right, grab the shovel and come with me. The man introduced himself as Jack, a local who had been helping out on the farm for the past few months, albeit with the understanding that his tenure was temporary. His assumption that Joe was merely another hired hand, rather than the new owner, sparked an idea in Joe's mind. Perhaps by stepping into the role of an employee, he could gain a deeper understanding of the farm's operations and challenges from the ground up. With a nod, Joe decided to play along. Joe followed Jack around the farm, trying to get a handle on the day-to-day -day tasks that kept the place running. Jack, for his part, was a man of few words. His responses to Joe's inquiries curt and to the point. It was clear that he preferred the company of pigs and chickens over people, especially city folks who didn't know the sharp end of a shovel from the handle. As they moved from one chore to the next, Joe did his best to mimic Jack's movements, but his inexperience was painfully obvious. Each attempt to dig or shovel feed was clumsy, the movements awkward and inefficient compared to Jack's practiced ease. What are you doing? You're going to take all day at that rate, Jack finally snapped, his patience wearing thin. The annoyance was clear in his voice as he grabbed the shovel from Joe's hands to demonstrate the proper technique. Like this, he said, the shovel slicing through the dirt with ease under his expert control. Joe, taken aback by the sudden outburst, could only nod and murmur an apology, trying to mirror Jack's technique. Never held a shovel before, have you? Jack grumbled, not really expecting an answer. His tone suggested that he found Joe's attempts more of a nuisance than a help. Joe, feeling the sting of embarrassment, shook his head. No, not really. I'm trying, though, he replied. Jack let out a huff, something that might have been a laugh if it weren't so full of skepticism. City boy's gonna have a rough time here, he muttered under his breath, though loud enough for Joe to hear. In the afternoon, Joe and Jack found a moment of respite on the porch, their hands occupied with simple sandwiches. The quiet was a welcome break from the morning's toil, but Joe, ever curious and somewhat eager to understand the rhythm of farm life, broke the silence. Is this all the work for today? He asked, hopeful, yet uncertain. Jack's response came with a knowing smile. If you want to stay employed here longer, don't ask these questions, young man, Jack advised. The message was clear. 
On a farm, the work was never truly done. The afternoon sun was relentless as Joe made his way to the vegetable plot, a parcel of land that Harold and Amy had nurtured into a thriving source of produce for the local farm market. The task Jack had set him on, scouring the potato leaves for beetles, seemed straightforward enough. Yet Joe found himself puzzled by the purpose. It wasn't until he actually saw the clusters of beetles, their tiny bodies a stark contrast against the green foliage, that he grasped the seriousness of his mission. Excited by his find, Joe rushed back to Jack, his voice tinged with a hint of pride. Hey Jack, guess what? I found a lot of beetles, he announced, eager for the next steps. So what next? Jack's response, a mix of amusement and disbelief, brought Joe back to reality. You really have no idea what you're supposed to do here, huh? Jack's question wasn't harsh, but it underscored Joe's inexperience. The realization that dealing with the Beatles meant a long, back-breaking process of physically removing each one by hand was a daunting prospect for Joe, who had hoped for a quicker, more modern solution. Can't we just kill them using some chemicals? Joe suggested, looking for an escape from the tedious task ahead. Jack's reply was a lesson in itself. You can, he said, then you can't sell them at the local market because they don't accept produce that's been treated like that. The implication was clear. The farm's commitment to natural, sustainable practices was non-negotiable, even if it meant extra work. And so Joe spent the remainder of his day in the field, painstakingly picking beetles off the potato plants. Each hour that passed brought with it a growing respect for the labor-intensive nature of farming and a creeping doubt about his impulsive decision to buy the farm. By sunset, his back ached, his hands were sore, and the romanticized vision of farm life had been thoroughly replaced by the reality of its demands. That night, Joe collapsed into bed, his body exhausted, but his sleep deep and undisturbed. The day's labor had taken its toll. The break of dawn was more of an interruption than a gentle awakening for Joe his muscles aching with every movement, a vivid reminder of the previous day's labor. He managed to drag himself out of bed. The farm was already stirring, the animals attended to, their contented sounds filling the morning air. As Joe made his way around the barn, the sight of Jack pushing a wheelbarrow, accompanied by a young woman, caught his attention. Her casual ease with the shovel and the ponytail swaying with her steps suggested she was no stranger to the demands of farm work. Must be the other employee Harold mentioned, Joe mused to himself. Dressing in the overalls he had found proved to be a challenge, his sore muscles protesting every movement. By the time he joined Jack and the girl, he was already breathless, the simple act of walking feeling like an ordeal. Jack's greeting was tinged with a mix of surprise and amusement. Look who's here, he exclaimed, eyeing Joe with a playful smirk. Our city boy is early today. Thought you'd be done after last night, he jested, expecting a reaction from Joe. But Joe's focus was elsewhere, captivated not by Jack's words, but by the girl standing beside him. Her laughter at Jack's teasing was melodic, and when Joe's eyes met hers, the hazel depths seemed to pull him in, rendering him momentarily speechless. Her attire, a blend of practicality and style with denim jeans and a jacket topped with a cowboy hat, only added to her allure. Joe's struggle to maintain his composure didn't go unnoticed by Jack, who, after a brief moment of watching Joe's futile attempt to respond, decided to intervene. Earth to Joe, Jack said, a hint of laughter in his voice, trying to snap Joe back to the present. The girl noticing Joe's discomfort offered him a warm, understanding smile. I'm Sarah, she introduced herself, extending a hand that Joe took, feeling a jolt of connection. Don't mind, Jack. He likes to give everyone a hard time at first. Joe managed a shaky smile, grateful for the kindness in Sarah's voice. I'm Joe, he replied, his voice steadier than he felt. And yeah, I'm quickly learning that about Jack. The laughter that followed broke the ice. Joe's sore muscles were forgotten in the wake of his new mission, to impress Sarah. He threw himself into the work with a zeal that surprised even Jack, 
who raised an eyebrow at Joe's sudden burst of energy. As they moved on to repairing a section of the fence that had seen better days, Joe insisted on taking on the more challenging tasks. Here, let me handle that, Joe said, reaching for the heavier hammer, as if he'd wielded one all his life. Sarah, leaning on her shovel, watched Joe with a mixture of amusement and curiosity. You sure about that? It's quite a bit of work, she warned, her tone light but cautious. Joe, with a confidence he didn't feel, nodded. Yeah, of course. How hard can it be, right? He replied, trying to sound casual. Jack snorted at Joe's bravado, handing over the hammer. All right, city boy, show us what you've got. The first swing was awkward, the hammer coming down with more force than Joe anticipated, causing him to nearly lose his balance. Sarah stifled a giggle as Joe tried to regain his composure, a slight flush creeping up his neck. Maybe like this, Sarah suggested, stepping forward to demonstrate a more effective technique for driving the nails into the fence post. Her movements were graceful and efficient, a stark contrast to Joe's clumsy attempt. Embarrassed but grateful, Joe watched intently, nodding as she explained the rhythm and force needed. Thanks, I'll give it another shot, he said, his voice laced with newfound respect for the skill involved in what had seemed like a simple task. Taking the hammer again, Joe mimicked Sarah's technique, and to his relief, the nail sank into the wood with a satisfying thud. Not bad, Jack conceded, a grudging note of approval in his voice. Throughout the remainder of the morning, Joe remained thoroughly engrossed in his work. Occasionally, he would glance over at Sarah, each time feeling an indescribable flutter in his heart as their eyes met. As they took a short break under the shade of a large oak tree, Sarah turned to Joe with a curious glint in her eyes. She leaned her back against the tree, wiping a bead of sweat from her forehead with the back of her hand. So, Joe, Sarah started, her tone casual but inquisitive, I've been wondering, what brings a city boy like you out here to work on a farm? It's not exactly a common career shift. Joe, caught off guard by the question, felt a momentary panic. He wasn't ready to reveal his true reasons for being there, least of all the fact that he was the new owner. He scrambled for a plausible story. Well, you know, Joe began, trying to sound nonchalant, I guess I was just looking for a change of pace. The city life, it's loud, fast, never stops. I thought maybe getting my hands dirty out here would, I don't know, give me a new perspective? Sarah eyed him skeptically, a small smile playing on her lips. A new perspective, huh? That's quite the leap from skyscrapers to potato fields. You sure there isn't more to it? It's not every day we get someone so enthusiastic about beetle picking. Joe laughed a bit too loudly, still skirting around the truth. Enthusiastic might be stretching it, but yeah, just seeking a simpler life, I suppose. You know, reconnect with nature, learn something new and all that. Beats sitting in an office all day. Sarah nodded, her expression softening. I can understand that. There's something about working with the land. It's grounding. But be warned, it's addictive. Once you get a real taste of farm life, the city might just lose its appeal. Joe met her gaze, grateful for her acceptance of his half-truths. I'll take that as a fair warning, he said with a smile. Who knows? Maybe I'll end up a convert to country life after all. As they worked side by side in the late afternoon sun, Joe seized the opportunity to learn more about Sarah. You seem to know your way around a farm pretty well, Joe remarked hoping to ease into a more personal conversation. Have you been doing this long? Sarah paused, leaning on her shovel as she seemed to weigh her response. Yeah, you could say that. Grew up on one, actually. Joe noticed the brief flicker of hesitation in her eyes and gently probed. Sounds like you have a lot of good memories there. She sighed, a wistful look crossing her face. I do, but not everyone sees it that way, she confessed her guard beginning to lower. Sensing her openness, Joe encouraged her to continue. Your family doesn't share your love for farming? Sarah shook her head, her ponytail swaying. It's not that simple. They love the farm, but they want more for me. 
They think I should be chasing a career in the city, something more modern and secure. Joe nodded, understanding the dilemma. And you don't feel the same way? No, I don't, Sarah admitted, her voice strengthening. This is where I belong. I love the land, the animals. It's part of who I am. But they're convinced farming's a dying lifestyle. They want me to go to college, get a degree, move away. Joe listened intently, struck by her passion and her struggle. It sounds like you're caught between two worlds. It's tough when your dreams don't align with expectations. Sarah looked at him, a mix of gratitude and surprise in her gaze. Exactly. It's like no matter what I say, it falls on deaf ears. They just don't understand that this is where I'm happiest. Joe, intrigued by Sarah's story and her obvious passion for farming, ventured another question, treading carefully. Why here? Sarah paused, a shadow crossing her features as she considered her answer. After the argument with my parents about college, things got pretty tense, she began, her voice carrying a hint of regret. They gave me an ultimatum, go to college or find my own way. So I left. Joe could hear the determination in her voice, but also the underlying hurt. That must have been tough, he said softly. It was, Sarah admitted. But then I saw the job posting for help here. I didn't care about the pay much. I just wanted to keep doing what I love. A smile flickered across Sarah's face. I've known Harold and Sarah for years. They're like everyone's grandparents around here. When I found out they needed help, I was more than willing to work even for free. The revelation struck Joe with a sense of kinship towards Sarah that he hadn't anticipated. Here they were, two individuals from seemingly different worlds, yet both standing at a crossroads shaped by familial conflict. The realization deepened the connection he felt with her, weaving a thread of shared experience between them. It's funny, Joe said, a thoughtful expression crossing his face. We're kind of in the same boat, you and I. I'm also here because of an argument with my parents. Sarah looked at him, her earlier reserve melting away, to reveal a genuine interest. Really? I wouldn't have guessed. What happened, if you don't mind me asking? Joe hesitated, not sure how much to reveal, but Sarah's openness and the bond they seemed to be forming encouraged him to open up. Let's just say they had very specific ideas about what success looks like, and I didn't fit the mold, so I ended up here trying to figure things out on my own terms. Sarah nodded, understanding reflecting in her eyes. It's tough, isn't it? Feeling like you have to choose between your family's expectations and your own happiness. Yeah, it is, Joe agreed, feeling a weight lift as he shared his story. Joe's resolve to turn the farm into a success solidified with each passing day, fueled not only by the desire to prove his worth to his parents, but now intertwined with his burgeoning feelings for Sarah. Her authenticity and passion for farming, so starkly different from the fleeting connections he'd experienced in the past, struck a chord deep within him. There was a purity in her love for the land, a sincerity in her laughter and words that drew him in making the laborious tasks they undertook together feel meaningful. The more time Joe spent with Sarah, be it shoveling manure, mending fences, or tending to the animals, the more he felt drawn to her. As the days turned into weeks, Joe's initial attraction to Sarah deepened into something more profound. The dirt under his nails, the sweat on his brow, and the aching of his muscles at the end of the day were badges of honor symbols of a day well spent in the company of someone who shared his newfound values. Joe took a deep breath before dialing Matt's number, the weight of their last encounter hanging heavily on his mind. Hello? Matt's voice came through, tinged with surprise. Hey, Matt, it's Joe. Joe started, his tone earnest. I, look, I owe you a huge apology, man. That night at the club, I was out of line. You were just looking out for me, and I didn't see it. There was a brief pause on the line, a moment of uncertainty that stretched between them. Joe, I... It's good to hear from you, Matt finally said, his voice cautious but warm. Then Matt let out a soft chuckle, 
the tension in his voice easing. Well, I'm just glad you're okay. So what's up? Taking a deep breath, Joe dove into the reason for his call. I need your help, Matt. I bought a farm. When Matt's car kicked up a cloud of dust along the gravel driveway of the farm, Joe felt a surge of gratitude and hope. Their embrace was a silent confirmation that their friendship had weathered the storm of their previous argument. As they broke apart, Joe was eager to share the new world he had stepped into, a stark contrast to the neon-lit nights they were accustomed to. Walking side by side, Joe led Matt through the sprawling fields, past the barns that creaked with age and stories, and alongside the pens that housed the farm's animals. He shared his dreams and ideas with Matt. Standing atop a small hillock that offered a panoramic view of the property, Joe turned to Matt, his expression serious. So what do you think? How can we turn this into a good business? Matt's gaze swept over the farm. He remained silent, his mind racing through calculations. The weight of Joe's question hung between them, a challenge that stretched beyond the boundaries of their friendship. The day gave way to evening, and the two men found themselves on the porch, the silence filled with the sounds of the farm winding down for the night. The potential paths they could take unfolded in their conversation, each scenario more elaborate than the last. As twilight turned to night, Matt prepared to leave, the quiet of the farm a stark contrast to the city's constant buzz awaiting him. A few weeks later, the farm had transformed in the span of a single day, its familiar landscape now dotted with unfamiliar sights and sounds. As Sarah and Jack watched the flurry of activity, their confusion was palpable, the quiet routine of farm life replaced by an unexpected bustle. The arrival of Joe, clearly orchestrating the setup, only added to the whirlwind of change. Sarah, feeling a mix of curiosity and unease, approached him, seeking answers in the midst of chaos. What's all this, Joe? Sarah asked, her voice cutting through the noise as she gestured towards the burgeoning setup. Joe's response was a smile, one that didn't quite reach his eyes. Taking her hand, he led her away from the commotion, towards the tranquility of the old oak tree, a place that had been a silent witness to their growing friendship. Under its sturdy branches, Joe finally shared his secret. I bought the farm from Harold and Amy, he confessed, his words heavy with implication. And you didn't think to tell us, she asked, her voice tinged with disbelief and hurt. Joe hurried to explain, his words laced with regret. I wanted to understand the farm, to really get to know it from the ground up. I thought it would be simpler if I just blended in at first, but then I didn't know how to bring it up. I didn't want anything to change between us. Sarah's frustration boiled over, her trust in Joe shaken to its core. You've been lying to us all this time. You were just concerned about your business, weren't you? She asked. Joe looked down, the gravity of his mistake settling in. No, Sarah, I didn't mean to lie. I just, I got caught up in everything. I thought I could make this work, make it better. I was going to tell you, but I never found the right moment. The silence that followed was charged, the gap between their perspectives wider than Joe had anticipated. Sarah's feelings of betrayal, coupled with her dedication to the farm and its legacy, left her reeling from the revelation. I don't know what to say, Joe, Sarah finally said, her voice soft but firm. I don't know if I can trust you the same way now, especially since you're now trying to turn the farm into something else. Joe's heart sank as he realized the extent of the damage his silent plans had caused. The farm, his dream of transforming it into something great, now seemed like a hollow victory in the face of Sarah's hurt. The evening air was filled with the twang of country music and the low murmur of conversations as the community gathered on the farm. Sarah, her decision to leave weighing heavily on her heart, was stopped in her tracks by the sight of her parents' familiar pickup truck navigating the gravel driveway. Approaching them with a mix of surprise and confusion, Sarah's greeting was lost in her urgent question. What are you doing here? She asked, her voice tight with emotion. 
We got an invitation, her mother replied, holding up a beautifully crafted card that Joe had sent out. Thought we'd come and see what it's all about. The farm, under the gentle glow of string lights and the setting sun, had transformed into a scene straight out of a country fairy tale. As the community started to trickle in, the lines between city folks and farm dwellers blurred, united by the music and the shared experience of the evening. Sarah, feeling like an outsider at what used to be her sanctuary, watched from a distance. Her resolve to leave was shaken by the sight of familiar faces, laughter, and the semblance of harmony that enveloped the farm. It was Joe's speech, however, that halted her departure. Standing on the makeshift stage with the crowd's attention riveted on him, Joe began to share his journey. He spoke of the Carsons with reverence, of his initial plans for the farm, and of the profound impact the land and its people had had on him. But it was when he mentioned Sarah that the chatter and music seemed to fade into the background. Joe's words, sincere and laden with emotion, reached her across the distance. And then there was Sarah, her passion for this land, her dedication, and her spirit. It made me see everything in a new light. Tears pricked at Sarah's eyes as Joe's confession unfolded. His acknowledgement of her influence, a balm to the hurt and betrayal she had felt. The crowd's applause at the end of his speech felt distant as Sarah grappled with the torrent of emotions Joe's words had unleashed. The music's melody lingered in the air, mingling with the sounds of laughter and conversation as the community, a blend of city dwellers and local farmers, celebrated together. Sarah, once poised to leave it all behind, found herself observing the scene from a distance, her emotions a whirlwind of doubt and hope. Jack, with his easygoing nature and a can of beer in hand, sidled up to her, a wide grin on his face. Looks like we're going to have to get used to guests soon, he remarked, gesturing towards the merry crowd. His comment, lighthearted yet insightful, hinted at the beginning of a new era for the farm. True to Jack's words, the farm underwent a gradual transformation. It became a haven, a weekend retreat that attracted people from the city eager for a taste of the countryside's tranquility and locals seeking a place to unwind. The blend of guests brought a new vibrancy to the farm, bridging two worlds in a way Sarah had never anticipated. Joe, recognizing the pivotal role Sarah played in this evolution, sought her out amidst the changes. This wouldn't be the same without you, Sarah, he confessed, his words sincere. Your passion for this place, your connection to the land, it's irreplaceable. Sarah, moved by Joe's acknowledgement and the unfolding transformation, decided to stay. The trust she placed in him in the vision they now shared for the farm marked a new chapter in their journey together. Six months later, the farm boasted a bustling restaurant that catered to the diverse tastes of its visitors. The weekdays maintained their quiet charm, a gentle reminder of the farm's roots, but the weekends came alive with the buzz of guests, each drawn to the unique blend of rural tranquility and hospitality the farm offered. Matt, ever the meticulous planner, took the reins of the financial aspects, ensuring the farm's ventures were both sustainable and profitable. The farm, now a vibrant weekend destination, buzzed with life and activity. Amidst the whirl of daily tasks and the laughter of guests, Matt approached Joe with a gleam of excitement in his eyes, signaling the inception of yet another ambitious venture. Joe, I've been thinking... Matt began, his voice brimming with enthusiasm. We've got a great thing going here, but why stop? What about taking it to the next level? Joe, wiping his hands on a cloth after tending to some repairs, turned to Matt, curiosity piqued. I'm listening, Matt. What's on your mind? Matt's eyes scanned the expanse of the farm, envisioning a future yet to unfold. A hotel, Joe. Imagine a place where our guests can not only dine and relax for the day, but also stay overnight, wake up to the serenity of the countryside. Joe's initial reaction was a mix of surprise and apprehension. A hotel? That's a huge step, Matt. Are we ready for that kind of expansion? Undeterred, Matt pressed on, laying out his vision with persuasive clarity. Think about it, Joe. 
We've already built a successful restaurant and people love what we're doing here. With a hotel, we can offer a complete getaway experience. And with the right planning, we can make it work seamlessly with the farm's ethos. Matt allowed a moment of silence to let the magnitude of his proposal sink in with Joe, noting the mixture of apprehension and intrigue on his friend's face. And don't worry about the financing, Matt added with a confidence that caught Joe off guard. I've already got that lined up. We're meeting the investors tonight. The dinner setting was picturesque, set in the now thriving restaurant on the farm. Matt, ever the orchestrator, played his cards close to his chest, instructing Joe and Sarah to wait at the table as he went to welcome the investors. The doors to the restaurant swung open and in walked Matt, flanked by two familiar figures. Joe's heart skipped a beat as he recognized his parents, Chuck and Linda, their faces alight with a mixture of pride and joy. The surprise of their presence rendered Joe momentarily speechless, the distance and disagreements of the past fading in the warmth of their smiles. Linda, overcome with emotion at the sight of her son, wasted no time in enveloping Joe in a tearful embrace. The transformation in Joe from the aimless youth he had been to the poised and purposeful man he stood as now was more than she had dared hope for. Chuck, observing the tender reunion between mother and son, found himself grappling with his own surge of emotions. The tears he fought to hold back were a silent testament to the pride swelling in his chest, a stark contrast to the stoic facade he often presented. The initial reunion gave way to introductions, with Joe proudly presenting Sarah as the farm's manager. The handshake and pleasantries exchanged between Sarah and Joe's parents. As the dinner progressed, the conversation flowed effortlessly, weaving through the farm's journey, the challenges overcome, and the visions for its future. Then in a moment that felt both monumental and intimate, Joe turned to Sarah, their hands entwined atop the table and announced, and there's something else. Sarah isn't just the manager here. She's my fiance. The revelation left Chuck and Linda speechless, their expressions a mix of surprise and delight. The evening, which had started as a simple investor dinner, had unfolded into a moment of profound personal significance, marking not just the reunion of a family, but the joining of two lives, two hearts committed to forging a future together on the land that had brought them all back home. The days leading up to the meeting of their parents were filled with a blend of excitement and nerves for Sarah and Joe. The couple meticulously planned every detail, hoping to bridge their worlds in the same harmonious way they had blended their lives. When the day arrived, laughter and heartfelt conversations filled the room, easing any lingering apprehension and knitting their families closer together. A month later, the farm, now a testament to transformation and growth, served as the backdrop for Sarah and Joe's wedding. It was a day marked by joy and a sense of unity, not just for the couple, but for everyone involved in their journey. Sarah's parents, once worried about her decision to remain on the farm, now shared laughter and lighthearted admissions. We never imagined this when you said you wanted to stay on the farm, her father said, a twinkle in his eye, reflecting the happiness he felt for his daughter's contentment and the unexpected path her life had taken. Meanwhile, Jack and Matt, integral parts of the farm's success and close friends of the couple, found themselves chuckling over a humorous anecdote shared by one of the guests. Their laughter was infectious, adding to the day's celebratory spirit. As the evening wore on, Joe found a moment of solitude behind the barn. In the quiet of his surroundings, he allowed himself a moment of reflection. Looking up at the expansive sky above, he felt a deep sense of gratitude swelling in his heart. He whispered a prayer of thanks, acknowledging the blessings in his life the love he shared with Sarah, the friendships he had forged, and the community they had built around the farm. In that serene moment, Joe realized the true extent of the transformation he had undergone. From the uncertainty that once marked his days to the fulfillment he now felt, his journey was a testament to the power of change, resilience, and love. As he rejoined the celebration, the sight of their loved ones, gathered together in a place that symbolized so much growth and hope, 
reaffirmed his belief in new beginnings. Sarah and Joe's wedding wasn't just a union of two hearts. It was a celebration of life's unexpected turns and the beautiful destinations they can lead to. The night ended under a canopy of stars with the farm bathed in the soft glow of lanterns, laughter and music filling the air. It was a fitting start to Sarah and Joe's new chapter together, surrounded by the people and the land that had brought them to this moment of unbridled joy and boundless potential.